Hello and welcome to Monarchist Minute, Royalist News in the good old United States of America. I am your host, Vice Chancellor Clements Magnolia. With me is one of my very, very good friends on this podcast, good old Water Cube. Always a pleasure to have you on here. It's always a pleasure to be here. It really is, honestly. And also, Fred, Frederick, he is here too. He's having a few technical issues. He'll be with us in just a moment, but he's always a wonderful to have on here as well. <clears throat> So, Watercube, how are you doing today, though? I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. How about you? Good. Got off work. Got some presents from my mama since it's, you know, tomorrow, since we're, over, we're recording this one day before Mother's Day. Uh, but, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Now, um, I don't really know what's really going on in the world. Half the time doesn't really matter anyways. It's America. We don't care about the rest of the world. We, unless there's some stupid crusade people want to make about. But who cares about that anyways? <laughs> Big ups for being overly invested in geopolitics while having no idea about domestic policy. Honestly. <laughs> well, no, I know about domestic policy, but I try to keep up with both as much I'm as I I'm just talking about the average American. Like, yeah, a lot of people yeah, get very yeah, yeah. invested in that, like, foreign diplomacy. Yeah, 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 yeah. you either have, you, ha you have the, you have, there's three different Americans. You have the one who is way too invested in domestic policy and none in foreign. The one who is way too invested in foreign and not in domestic. And the one who just doesn't fucking care. God bless the apathetic average voter. Honestly, I love the median voter. The median voter. We love the median voter. <laughs> the politically apathetic are the ones to lead yeah, the true yeah. revolution. And this, yeah, this is exactly why. Uh, I remember talking to some of my coworkers and telling them that in Australia it is illegal to not vote. Because, I mean, technically it is. Wait, it is illegal to not It's yeah, illegal but, to vote down there? Not, not vote. Not, not vote. Yeah, you get a big fine. Like yeah. if you don't vote. It's like a $500 fine if you don't vote in Australia. But that's like Australian dollars. That's basically Monopoly money. Yeah. <laughs> they do not have purchasing power. The fools. <laughs> I thought people had the right to vote and not no, vote. No, no, no. You, in Australia, you do not have a choice to opt out of democracy. Yeah. That's crazy. Like, you can, you can spoil your ballot. But yeah. you have to, you have to have a ballot. You have to put, you have to use your ballot. You have to you turn on your ballot. Actually, that makes one. Of, I have an Australian friend, and she voted for the. Uh, I don't remember what the party is. It's just named after a guy. He's like right wing populist. That's the best way. Oh, to kinda... oh, was it, oh no no. It's um Pauline Hanson. No, not him. No, 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 not 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 her. Okay, um, Cl Clive Palmer. No, like no. My friend is a woman. He she voted for a guy and that was like right wing oh. populist and has like one yeah. representative. Yeah, yeah talking about it was Clive Palmer. The, yeah, the, talk uh, about... um, what it was the um, it wasn't United Australia. Uh, yeah, not, talk not about... United Australia. It's the party is named after him. The party is like his name. Are you sure it's yeah. not Pauline Hanson? Yeah, talk I about that sounds, that sounds like Pauline Hanson. Yeah, um, talking about populism. Have you seen Lavender's video? On, uh, uh, yeah, I, I watched. I watched part of it. To be honest, I, uh, I mean, I, I think he was okay. I watched like the first ten minutes of it, and after, and after that, I'm like, I, I kind of get the point of it all because it kind of just seemed like it was a, like I love the guy, but it seemed I'm, I'm a patron of his anyways. But it seemed just a bit repetitive, and I got the point pretty quickly about it, so I didn't really think too much of it. I mean. It's kind of the same old points that, you know, we as monarchists usually talk about the fact that the populace is very easily susceptible to populism, and populism very easily can be used by those to get into power, and it's not actually the will of the majority of people, yada, yada, yada. It's the same story over and over again. It's yeah, yeah, the like the middle Four class. Years. And the, yeah. Don't look over there. Keep going, keep going. I was going to say, I found the political party. It was the, it's Catter's Australian party. Oh, 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 that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy yeah she the voted for him. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it makes sense because if she's from if she's from um, Queen, rural Queensland, then it makes sense. I don't think she is. Oh, okay. I, I think she just voted for him because I, I don't know why. She's kind of an agent of chaos. Like, they, <laughs> I don't really think too hard about her yeah. political beliefs. I, I try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> all right, then. Not really. But, uh. I did not watch the Lavender video, so I do not have context. I'm just guessing it's the talking points against populism, like the usual there. Yeah, I mean, of course, he goes into more detail like he always does, but, you know. Um, what, was I mean, what, what, did, what did you think, um, 
what you what did you think about it, um, Fred? Fred? Uh, sorry, I was reading something. Uh, you know, the push the talk things. Um, yeah, oh, I'm looking at Lavender's channel. I'm seeing him mentioning Giovanni Gentili in the thumbnail of the Umberto Echo video. Oh yeah, that's a good video. Love though. that Giovanni Gentili guy, a true Hegelian. <laughs> but what did you think about it, um, Fred? 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 Oh, it's Jover. Well, but what was the video called? The recent one by Lavender? Uh, Anon is asking for it. Um, which one? The one about, um... Um, the video that Fred was talking about? Yeah, no, I just found it and I just, uh, sent it. There you go, Are Anon. You okay, Enjoy. good. I... With populism, like, the populism does have a use, though, I think. Oh, you cut out instantly. Yeah. Me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, all I just said was, yeah. Like, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, there's a book that I've been meaning to read, The Crowd, which helped, I think, help inspire Italian fascism to some degree, at least how Mussolini handled oratory. Mm -hmm. And it just, like, has to do with the mass psychology of, uh, like, same with Edward Bernays' propaganda. Like, the crowd is easily manipulable. Like, it's never the will of the people, but yeah. the people have a will, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But, but, but the people are stupid. <laughs> but, yeah, you have a point there. The people are stupid, yet the people are smart at the same time. It's a very weird yeah. contradiction. They're it's a parody like, of themselves. It's like in the middle. Like, you have their dumb side, and then you have them being, you know, smart Alex. Yeah, they're certainly capable of being intelligent, but they're sometimes capable of not being intelligent. Yeah, it's yeah. That's why it's democracy like, kind of fails on itself very often. Yeah, yeah, they like to say the king is fallible, but the people are also fallible as well. Yeah, like the people tend to be more fallible than not. Like when you have strong leadership, the system tends to work, even if it's an incompetent leader. And oftentimes, if you have, like, good, strong leadership that's self-aware, you'll get a situation like Singapore with, like, Lee Kuan Yew, where he was able to pass a session to a hand-picked uh, successor, and that led to a very stable system. Authoritarian, but it worked Very out. authoritarian, yeah. Brutally authoritarian, yeah. but it enforced a yes. social order. And, like, with the system in Singapore on how multi-ethnic it was and trying to stop that ethnic conflict, they did a good job using that authoritarianism to stop that racialism. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to think, a lot of it is that with the modern, at least modern authoritarian or anything that's non-democratic, even like, it's hard to find good modern examples because a lot of the times most authoritarians that have gained power that weren't institutionalized had to rely on populism and oftentimes just gave into the crowd, be it group, um, people like Mugabe, <sighs> trying to think who else Mugabe, Gaddafi to a large extent relying on pan-arabism the baathist parties yeah 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 um i think japan is kind of like that japan's more of like a confederacy of political machines under their conservative party yeah 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 because uh it you haven't been really seen parties like um you know taking power it's just like the single party that has dominated since World War II. Yeah, but like that was also like that authoritarianism or that kind of control by that one party has not really been in Japan's favor. Like it worked out, but it also caused a lot yeah. of issues. Like, and, and it's also the same for South Africa because, you know, the ANC. I think I don't know enough about South Africa's domestic situation, but I think they have a bit more local, like local and regional democracy. The J Japanese system, with how yeah. entrenched the Conservative Party is, that even locally people can't really get their voices heard, and also how the Conservative Party there, I think the Liberal Democrats, I believe, they are very reliant on Mooney support. 
which is always a bad sign when like a cult yeah. is in, like putting money in your pockets. Yeah. Yeah. Um I've been looking into South Africa. Like they're they're having like a lot of problems. Like, you know, the power is out for like hours. Rumor is that they're that running water ain't going pretty good. South Africa's there. always had like a huge issue and also like Apartheid only really ended in the 90s, and it's only been 30 years. There's still parts of the like the American South that are suffering from the effects of segregation and then desegregation. So it's kind of expected that South Africa would be in the state that it is. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll give them like about 30 more years, and if it's still the same situation, then I would say it's an intrinsic problem with the system or who's leading down there. And, uh, Joe, I saw your message. Uh, yeah, I think Project 2025, like, it probably won't succeed. Isn't Project 2025, um, what, like, that thing about, um, um, like, some, like something put forward by Trump or whatever, or the Trump team or something? It was something that cooked out of a conservative think tank. Yeah, honestly, like, I saw, like, um, some, li- some guys on another server who are pretty left-wing, like, completely losing their mind over it. One of them DM pinged me and he's like they're gonna destroy our democracy don't you like are you in favor of getting rid of our democracy and i'm like dude i don't this thing isn't gonna go anywhere it's like it, it <laughs> kind of felt like one of those like long-winded plans of hoping to gain success and have that perpetual victory through corruption or whatever like I, I don't get it i don't get the end game if they institute their system they're gonna eventually realize hey conservatism that's based solely on capitalism is not going to work itself out. It's going oh, to yeah. eat itself. Yeah. Obviously. And, and, no the, fact, and yeah. the fact that they'll say we need to protect democracy. Meanwhile, there's polls that says the younger generation would rather have an authoritarian leader than, you know, a democratic institution over them. But it's because so. we, like, as a society, like, have lost faith in liberal bourgeois uh, systems. Like, there's yeah, this guy, yeah. uh, I saw a very interesting, I think it was like a TikTok a bit ago, talking about the etymology with like how Gen Z approaches the world, like compared to the linguistics of the past, millennials, generations, even going back to the 20s, always kind of had a hope with their linguistics on like the th- terms they were using. And meanwhile, Gen Z is using terms like doomer and such. Like we are, <laughs> yeah, we lost faith in our society. Like uh, the quote from Hunter S. Thompson comes to mind where he's talking about how the party is over. Gen Z will never experience what the generations before had. Yeah, but like America had its golden years, I believe, either in the 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 60s or 50s. No, oh no, I wouldn't say that. Like it was good for like white middle class like yeah we had a strong white middle class but like i'd say it's the 80s where we were able to really get up there with really that's when we were on our up and ups yeah yeah because we overcame like at least in the american psyche overcame racism overcame all the social issues that we were going through and we were able to actually feel actualized as the equal american Mm -hmm. republic that we've always wanted to strive for that shining city on a hill and then it slowly collapsed in on itself once the Soviet Union collapsed because we had no enemy to define ourselves by. We only had liberal democracy and the Fukuyamaist nightmare and that nihilism. Like, we don't know how to define ourselves. We tried to pick, like, Islamism as the enemy, but that's such a vague enemy and just gets you into a forever war against insurgents compared to something you can build up against and fight along the periphery and proxy wars against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not only that, like, because of these wars, people are going to be questioning the government and this and that. And, and also, nowadays, the people don't really trust the government anymore. I think that like really started also in the 80s with that like high point. It gave a lot of people free time to... It's kind of like with the rise of the weird occult in the 1800s, where that came from a lot of bored rich people, some like aristocrats that kind of like lower level aristocrats looking for something to do. Yeah. They would just embrace the stuff. Conspiracies were on the rise. Like Alex Jones started really picking up in the nineties and then in the early two thousands. Yeah. And New world order conspiracy. The fact that 2012 was such a phenomena, like Americans have been bored and also started yearning for apocalypse and for something to be scared of. Yeah. Yeah. Because of a, uh, what was it? Accelerationism where well, they treat, where they treat the apocalypse as a gift. 
No, I, no. I, I would say it's the fact that people were so used to the threat of nuclear war during the Cold War that when we finally lost it, people were like, well, what do I fear now? Yeah, exactly. That's more it. Like, accelerationism was more developed. Like, it was developed in the 90s in the UK. Like, with Nick, well, there was accelerationism before that with James Mason Siege and the Turner Diaries and such. Uh, and that was specifically the neo Nazi right. But accelerationism yeah. is a flushed out ideology, only came about in the 90s with the CCRU with Nick Land. Yeah, I think it came from a sci fi book. Or at least it was inspired by a sci-fi book. No, it was, okay, it was inspired by a mixture of, like, people like the Losing Guitari, George Pate, a couple other thinkers who helped Nick Land, and the CCRU, which was, like, this think tank that existed, I don't remember which campus it was in, U- in the UK, they did a lot of psychedelics, and I think Nick Land kind of oh, had yeah. a uh, psychosis after doing a lot of stimulants, and he came up with the... Book, he wrote the book Thirst for Annihilation, mm-hmm. and I think he further developed the ideas down the line. It's also where we got pe- thinkers like Mark Fisher, who wrote Capitalist Realism, which is also a useful book. A lot of good thinkers came out of the CCRU, even yeah. though they are a little insane. Yeah, like they say that, you know, we have to accelerate things because uh, technology and this and that can solve our problems. Uh, it varies like because accelerationism as a school of both political and philosophical thought is the idea that the system is bound to collapse um some of them like lean heavier on uh, technology some of them lean on primitivism some of them just want a warlord period like there's yeah, a whole uh, thing called like acute uh, accelerationism now um yeah I- i'm guessing like y'all have seen on twitter like the thing like the fem cell dating app have y'all seen or heard about that i have not no oh okay basically yeah there's an app. i would yeah i I would be considered a decelerationist because I want to go back to like monarchism. No, some way. accelerationists are like firmly monarchist. Cute accelerationism. Okay. Um, and on the just get very briefly explained, it's a accelerationist thought. I came out of the Suki cult on 4chan, which basically embraces the idea of being a, having acute aesthetic, so on. It's pro anorexia, pro a whole bunch of other like kind of disgusting things, focuses highly on femininity, but they yeah. made a dating app. And I, I just don't know what to make of that because the accelerationists are weird. They create weird cultures. And a lot of Gen Z, I think, would <laughs> fall into somewhat the accelerationism because Gen Z has a healthy death drive. Like there's a lot of like a lot of yeah. like, this generation is either going to produce the next fascism or it's going to produce it's going to produce something awful. And it's going to be interesting yeah, to say the yeah. least. We're going to live in interesting times and I'm excited for it personally. Yeah, pretty interesting times. Um, yeah, like I think, uh, what was it? The the it used to be White House uh, chief of staff Steve Bannon was considered a right accelerationist. I, I think you could consider it. like accelerationism also is somewhat of a buzzword because it's something that can be overused. A lot of leftists would accuse each other of accelerationism. Some leftists are just accelerationists. Yeah. Like, yeah. but they, uh, it's like a good thing to throw in if you want to fear monger about someone who's trying to bring about apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like they want to bring utopia, but like, you know, put it on steroids and try to make it faster, you know? Well, like, sometimes the, like, they don't even want utopia. Like, <laughs> a lot of accelerationists just yeah. want to be able to actualize themselves via violence. Uh, the whole movement around, like, Bronze Age pervert, I think, could be classified as a uh, accelerationist. Yeah, like, there, there's some movements on the right that want to, like, accelerate, like, you know, the next civil war or something, you know? Yeah, because people are seeking for a violent resolution to the current system because the system feels like, one, it's stagnating and it's just getting worse for a lot of people. Like, it's going to get to a point where a bunch of people realize that they have nothing left to lose and that's a dangerous position. Yeah, uh, you got to watch out for those kinds of people. But like, the thing is, there's a lot of those people being built up. There's an excess of them. It's like... There's also a rise in the lumpen proletariat because of how like hard it is to make some income in this. Like a lot of people have turned to either side hustles, stuff that might not be legal, kind of entering into that illegalist track. And, and that's yeah. not even getting into just like 
I, I know people that have had to turn to sex work just to make rent in some places because and it's terrible. Yeah, that, that that's yeah, that's pretty sad. They, they don't want to do it. They're just forced to by their circumstances. Yeah, of course. And like that's becoming a common trend, but also at the same time with the how social media functions, we can see great splendor at the same time we see great suffering in our society and in the world, but like mostly just in America yeah, domestically. And, and that's why a lot of Gen Zers see this and they're like, what, what can we do to fix society as, you know, as we see it? I'm not sure if like a lot of people are even focused on fixing it, more just something different because this clearly doesn't work. Anything would be an improvement. It's kind of like, eating the same thing every day you'll just want something else it could be the worst thing for you but it's just something else it's an escape yeah. from the monotony yeah. and from the suffering yeah like video games you're escaping reality because you know reality is shit well i'm not even more specifically talking about escapism i more mean like turning to certain radical ideologies like anarcho nihilism neo-nazism uh, yeah. stuff like that yeah all of those ideologies you know that you would think no one would be going for it. People are churning to. It doesn't help that like there's a struggle for self-definition in the modern era, especially with identity. Because like with how the liberal bourgeois capitalist system kind of structured itself, people are now kind like people try to sell themselves at all times. Like I mentioned this before on the podcast, but Tinder, Tinder's just a meat market where you try to sell yourself to other people. That's all oh, it yeah. is. And yeah. that sort of behavior is just normalized outside of dating apps, like everywhere. Like it's why there's a lot of wannabe influencers. There's a want, lot of wannabe, just the guys that where they think they're going to lead the movement because they think they could sell themselves just enough to be something like an object of history. Like it's also a level of alienation because the internet, like the internet, in my opinion, just causes a behavioral sink. Like there's so much over socialization where people just do not get a break from it. They just continually, there's always a constant access online. Someone can always message you if you're online, if you have a phone, if you're that, even if like, you try to take a step back away from it, that access kind of remains and it's hard to, disconnect oneself from it it's also the idea of always constantly being perceived which is terrifying to most people like psychologically people don't like being perceived people get anxiety around it on some subconscious level even if they're perfectly fine being in front of the crowd it still causes a level of stress And like, I don't really know how Gen Z is going to respond to that once we are really full force in the workforce, like when we're starting to reach our 30s or 40s, because we're going to have to figure out some self-definition, like the whole wave of uh, femboys. I'm going to pick on them for a brief second, and that feels a little arbitrary, but <laughs> yeah. there's basically a whole cohort of people who define themselves solely by their youth. And because like once that youth goes away they have nothing left. Yeah, and then they're going to have to turn to a new identity in if order If they can to find them. one. Because, like, to put in, like, a Lacanian psychoanalysis terms, they're going to have an experience with the real, this great trauma that they're going to have to restructure how they view the world and how they conceptualize of everything from that point yeah. onwards. Yeah, like, they can actually, like, some of them could be like, we need to grip to reality, this and that, like, not, we shouldn't, you know, cling to like an identity anymore because you know it's not going to help us well we always seek identity because <laughs> yeah yeah but but in a way like people are going to like you know see that reality isn't like based on re identity I think it's okay I'm, I'm thinking about this specifically from like Lacanian psychoanalysis where it's like our identity and what we build up and to perceive the world, there's the uh, symbolic, which are like the symbols and then the like or the words and the imaginary, which is the images we apply those symbols to. And those things connect together to form kind of a screen that protects us from the Lacanian real, which is the actual world. And 
basically our identity informs that screen. So we always seek to build identity because we can't ever fully consciously communicate our true self. We don't have the linguistics to communicate what our soul is really feeling. And because of that, we're always going to grapple with identity to try to protect us from that real. Because the real is that experience where life, it's not that life is meaningless, everything sucks. It's more just we exist in this material world when we do not know what to make of it. We have no purpose and it's kind of terrifying to be in. Yeah, because in this liberal order, when everything's like industrialized, this and that, and you know, technology improves and it could take your job away from you, you're like, What's what's the purpose of me being here when everything else is being stripped from me, you know? Well, like that anxiety about like the security is always ever present inside of industrial capitalism. But we specific like in post-industrial capitalism, it's also still there. Like we just yeah. with how capitalism tends to go for it wants to make all of us consumers. That's what it prefers. It's why yeah. capitalism invented the teenager. Yeah, that. Yeah, and I believe uh, Lavender mentioned this, like, the, capitalism is only good when it makes your country rich, but what it does, it creates this mindless consumerism. Well, it's like, it's mindful consumerism. We are now in the era of a self-conscious capitalism. During the, like, 80s and 90s, there was a... Uh, unconscious capitalism where it was that mindless consumers and people bought stuff and didn't think about where it came from what it was whatever now you have something like where oh if you go to starbucks buy a coffee they say oh they i'll donate like one percent to the poor children in africa so you can feel moral about that purchase because you are now self-conscious you're self-aware yeah but even then you're not sure how that money is going to go because that money could just you know go to that you know, the corporation's, like, pocket. Well, yeah, no, that's true, but I'm more speaking about, like, the idea that it just says that still brings some comfort. It's, like, there's a thing that I'd describe as the left-wing slash communist prayer, which is yeah. there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, which is the cope to, that they use to just excuse random consumerism. Yeah, but also that could be used to, you know... Just to give money to the corp corporation and that kind of stuff. So it's basically propaganda in a way. Well, it's it's more like a self affirmation that when some when you, like the communist, the anti capitalist, whatever consumes under capitalism, they are okay with doing it because there's no other option. There is no escape from the uh, bourgeois system or whatever. And it comes off as rather pathetic because I on I have only ever seen it used to rationalize like buying something as decadent as like buying like a Funko Pop. Like there's no use in a Funko Pop. Yeah. No offense to anyone who collects yeah. them. Like, if you collect them, oh, yeah, do your own thing. I don't really care. Like me and Farago. Yeah, but still, you still kind of have like that mindless consumerism where it's like we're just buying random shit. For no yeah. apparent reason, even though we're not going to use that shit. Yeah, like um, there is something like this is like a Marxian take, but I think it's valuable is the idea of commodity fetishism. I think that's just one thing that's explicitly true about capitalism is that commodity fetishism exists. And when we buy something, there is a fetish inside of it, a soul, some form of like the ideal that we view in it that makes us want to consume even further. Like it plays into the yeah. and it plays into yeah. that where we value the object more than it would ever be useful to us as a person. Coca Cola makes us thirstier, yet we buy it anyway because it has the Coca Cola branding and the flavor. Yeah. What is it? There's a few brands of um, bottled water yeah. that we've had too. Yeah, Dasani. Yeah, it's Dasani, yeah. Which is also made by Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah. I see Sternerite stuff in the podcast stage chat. I, I see you, Anon. I know what you are. Yeah. There has been actually kind of a revivalism around Sterner, I've noticed, among the left. Like, I've been keeping my ear to the ground with that stuff, and it's fascinating to see egoism get reappraised because it was kind of, like, thrown into the backwater of history. There's, like, and it's shocking to witness. Like when it comes down though with like moving beyond nowadays it, like, it's like 
we want free shit, right? What do you mean? And it's not about liberating the workers anymore, right? Uh, that's no. Unless, I think that would typologize the left a bit. Like, that's not. It just doesn't feel accurate. A lot of like the modern left does actually care about the proletariat. The thing is that a lot of the left also, the ones that are the major speakers tend to be of either a petty bourgeois or labor aristocracy, where they're in a position where they've had class privilege for a while, where they can't even really fully empathize with the proletariat, what they would define as the proletariat. It's why you got groups like the MAGA communists and so on showing up where it's this attempt to try to redefine and themselves also the, the proletariat. And also the champagne um, socialists as well. Well, champagne socialism, like has for the most part died out now we have like a more radical marxism like well you have like the vague leftist which you could classify as a champagne socialist but well well they're they're still kind of around like you know second thought um vosh those guys oh that vosh like I, I i don't even know how to address vosh vosh is a creature unto his own like vosh is I don't even know if you can really call him a communist because the fact that stuff he has said is just so. Out I think he there. defines himself as like a democratic socialist or whatever, yeah. which is just like the cop out thing of like, I want socialism. What does that mean? Oftentimes they're just social democrats or Lasallians or like if you get really lucky, like someone who wants to nationalize key businesses. Well, I mean, I don't. I mean, oh, yeah. He was. He one time he was in a conversation with. It might have been Destiny. I honestly don't remember. But De- uh, whoever it was brought up 1984, the book. And Vosh said that he unironically thought it was a good idea for a system of governance. No, it I is never not thought a good I idea. agree with Vosh. I agree with, like, I think 1984 is a utopia. The proletarians are free. The only people who are oppressed are the middle class. <laughs> Well, so that's a good ending. Well, it's because it's because the proletariat are dumb. Well, it's because like, like, they don't really care about them because there's no reason to go after them because they they're dumbed out to the point where they're like they're not going to revolt. It's not th- about stupidity that causes them not to revolt. It's because they just meet their basic needs. The middle class or the outer party in the world of 1984, like those are the ones that only have revolutionary potential. They're the ones that w- are the threat to the system, so they need to be terrorized in order to maintain the system, which honestly is true in a lot of systems. Like for a while with the feudal period, like the bourgeois would be like ter- uh, terrorized by the feudal lords because they were the ones that had potential to actually threaten the feudal power structures. And they were essentially the middle class. They were above the serfs. They were above the peasants. They were in this kind of middle zone and they had resources. Yeah, yeah, but also... You know, 1984, they control information. You know, they they decide what is true and what is not. Which like, is, like, always kind of been the case with humanity. There was cases back in the Bronze Age. Uh, after the Bronze Age collapse in Egypt, there was whole things where little despotisms would rise up. Like, I don't remember exactly what, like, dynasty or leaders there were, but they would completely destroy all the history of the previous leaders and just replace, like, the name, like, oh, it's let's just say X person built this monument, they would change it to Y person, which is the person that was in charge at the time. Like changing history has been humanity's way to cope with the past. We like revisionism. It's our strong suit. Yeah, and that's why history needs to be preserved. Yeah, the Koreans had a very interesting system where uh, the monarch was not even allowed to look at the history book from the official recorders. It's why there's like that meme that was going around talking about. Oh, like, about the the one who he he fell off his horse. He told his the scribes do not write that down, and the scribes wrote down that he told them not to write it down. Yes. Yeah, that's funny. like in that's a good system for preserving history and stopping revisionism. But revisionism is common. It's common in all parts of society, and it's something that like. We don't we're conscious of, but we're at the same time will ignore if it's convenient to ourselves and to our own narratives. It's how narratives are made to begin with. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Now, now, even though their conditions are met in the book, like society around them is like 
kind of gray and dual. Oh yeah, well, like n- 1984 <laughs> is by no like a good society. Uh, Frederick, you're echoing really badly. Yeah, I got a bit of an echo back there. <clears throat> like it, but it is an interesting thing about like that system technically would be sustainable at infinitum. They like uh have their own excess that they just waste on war they don't produce or move forward history at all it's just a static period and orwell like one thing to consider is also he was a socialist and he was writing it out of fears of stalinism nazism and just this er totalitarianism yeah and an interesting part you know the what was it the minutes of hate or something oh the two minutes of hate yeah the two minutes of hate yeah yeah, so basically, it's you hate on the the enemies of the state kind yeah. of thing. Oh yeah, it, it's like something that was common in a lot of systems, like like thought reform and uh, like it happened in the Cultural Revolution. It happened in a lot of struggle sessions among Maoist groups. It was also yeah. common in like Nazi groups to like get everyone together to hate on X group or something like that because it reinforces group identity. It, the easiest way to make sure your group remains solid is to have an out group that you can solidly hate and detest with all your heart. Yeah. But but you know, like all systems do it. Still. But still humanity has to be aware of uh authoritarian uh you know, tendencies because uh, people could. I mean, inevitably, almost everyone is has authoritarian tendencies in to one degree or another due to the fact that we are, of course, a sinful people. Like in yeah, and and we're also them. ambitious people as well. Yeah. And also, like authoritarianism tends to be the path of least resistance. Same with totalitarianism. It's like it's easier to just cede to okay. a strong man and cede to a system compared to having agency yourself a lot of people hate agency actually getting back to the cute accelerationism thing for a quick second one thing they fetishized was lobotomies and that is like the most direct form of wanting to remove your own <laughs> agency i've ever seen uh, like yeah and, people don't and like going acting. back to that authoritarian thing like it's it's always like the the loop right like we always go back to authoritarianism in one way or another. Like, yeah, it, because it just is naturalistic. When you have a system that's complex, it works better out when, like, you don't have to, have to wait for a vote. You don't have to wait for democracy. Democracy tends to slow things down. It's why a lot of... Um, Slavoj Zizek, I think, made some critique of anarchism where he didn't want to have to go to, like, 10 different meetings just to decide how the water is going to, like, work or how's that going to be pumped yeah. up, how's the trash yeah. going to and, be and, up. And it's also, like, the cycle of empires. Like, the British Empire soon got, you know, the empire status taken away, and then the Americans became the the sole empire, with, you know, the Russians in that way. Uh, what, what do you mean? Like, like... Like, it's kind of like a cycle. We go from democracy to dictatorship, democracy to dictate, you know? Well, like, I wouldn't say that. Like, the cycle tends to be more toward, like, a uh, waxing wane between centralization and decentralization. It can come in both forms of authoritarianism and, like, a democratic system. But it tends to just oscillate between those stages. Like, uh, feudal was fairly decentralized. The rise of the nation state centralized it. I think we're in the... In, but before that, there was also the Bronze Age, which was fairly centralized. Like there was a state there that to be relied on. It might have not been the most well, efficient, but well, it's still it, centralized. It was mostly like the city states, you know. Well, it was city states. And then, but in then way. you had like uh, the Sassanids. Like, like it wasn't the like whole... the nation. It was like mostly like the city states. Well, like I think like, with the death of the Polish system, like you had the Which Persian was, Empire know, with the develop- satrapy system, you had the Roman Empire with the provinces. Like those things were heavily centralized with clear command structures and clear deferments of authority. And then the reaction against that, like in history, was a decentralized system with feudalism. And then it centralized again as it was able to build itself together. And then whenever this system collapses, 
it will probably go back to some decentralization. Hello? Uh, Frederick, did you uh, did that not come through? Radio check. Brad? Uh, he's probably having problems on his end again. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, it's probably... Sorry, it was internet problems again. Sorry. Oh, you're all right. So, uh, so what? So what was I saying before um that I, happened? Yeah, you were talking about how like it was mostly city states in the Bronze Age, and I was talking about how like the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, and these other centralized forms came out of that system before feudalism, and those had pretty clear structures for authority. Yeah, yeah. So before, like, the city states were the ones that were, I believe, mostly centralized. No, well, like, the city states were pretty decentralized, but then things started to grow. They started becoming, like, centralized nations, and then they fractured because there's a point where you reach, like, an optimal centralization where the system gets comfortable with itself and it starts to decline. Yeah. Yeah, like, the Roman Empire, like, it, it was so massive it couldn't really govern itself very well. I'd say, and, like, and not and not only that, like foreigners had an influence on it, because you know they were the ones that were leading to its downfall in a way. Uh, are you talking about like the Visigoths, the Goths, and all those different groups? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I wouldn't say they really led to the downfall. By the time of the Ravenna court, it was already over. Like, yeah. yeah. I'd say honestly, the hammer, like in the uh, the last nail in the coffin, was like, when Arulian uh, took out the Gallic Empire and the Paul Myron Empire, mm -hmm. because the, and, that would have been a more and, efficient way to govern it by having three empires instead of one massive one. Yeah, and not only that, like the Roman populace were like so ignorant of the downfall because you know they were you know more focused on like you know. Coliseums and that kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know. say it was that. Like, like, it's hard to acknowledge when a system is actually collapsing on itself until it becomes like, overt fighting in the streets. Like, yeah. a lot of the system, when it's in decline, it tries to distract the population from that decline so it can make it less seen. Uh, like, I, I wouldn't say that either because, like, that the distraction is always present to always distract from, like, the problems of a society. The distraction is always there even if it, the society is at its peak. It tends to be better distractions at its peak because it's trying yeah. to show off splendor and greatness. Yeah. And, and, you know, not it's like a cover to, like, the cracks. I wouldn't say, but, like, it's, it's a cover but also people also just kind of like those things and it's a good way to get popular support to reinforce the system. Yeah. Yeah. Bread and circuses works. Once the grain dole stops and once people start, like, oh, well, stop having food on the table, that's when stuff tends to fully break down. Yeah. 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 That's when, that's no, because when, when, because when the, the price of food is skyrocketed and, you know, you're starving, you're like, okay, Time to grab the arms. We're gonna do this thing to yeah. get free bread and shit. Like, well, in, in picking on Rome a bit more, like with the grain dole and the slow collapse of the grain dole, like as soon as Egypt and Tunisia were kind of lost, like it was just, it was just over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sad thing. Like. Uh, I don't think any of us would really be aware. Let's just say, like, right now the system is collapsing. We wouldn't be aware that the system is actually collapsing. I don't think the system's collapsing, personally. But I, I know a lot of people do. I hear from the left yeah. all the time, like, we're in late-stage capitalism. Like, no, we're just I know, at the yeah. start. I, I know. Like, I heard um, when I was in um, my um, ethics class, uh, it was near the beginning of the class, one girl walked up to the teacher and she said, it's, it's obvious that we're in late-stage capitalism. And after she left, I said to him, it's not. We have no idea what late stage capitalism even really looks like, so we can't say, are we? Well, maybe we are, but we can't tell because it's never happened before. Yeah, like we have no idea what's around the corner. We could end up with like the we don't worst even, society. We don't even we don't even actually know what late stage capitalism is. All we have is just some rough guesses from people who were talking about it. Like maybe that is late stage capitalism, but what if it isn't though? Because we can't tell. Because guess what? It's never happened before. Yeah, like 
in even if you try to yeah. predict it, like yeah. you can at most maybe make some guesswork about the social relations, but even then, it's gonna be weak. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm betting when this does like come crashing down, whatever comes after it though will be decentralized and like whatever post capitalism looks like, it, it's it's gonna be something that will seem alien and scary to us. Or now. like, or like post liberal order kind of thing. It's like with when the liberal order collapses, so does capitalism. They go down together. They both rely on each other yeah, to reinforce because, each other. Yeah, because uh, one of them is the the butter and the other is the bread. You know. And both of them go together. Yeah, like, liberalism really ushered in bourgeois rights, land rights, all that, equality, fraternity, all that schlock. And, yeah, and, and yeah. also all the other stuff that, um, that, um, you know, that the right accuses of, you know, being bad, but, but they're the ones, like, supporting it because you know a lot of the right supports like freedom this and that you know here well, in america the right is the champions of unrestricted capital while the left tends to try to restrict it radical left tries to uh like just wants to destroy it and i i, I get it but i also like most of the time they're stupid as shit like i i i've been i was been seething about the current state of the left all day to a uh, grave and it's yeah. depressing. It, and liberalism is the reason why, you know, the right uh, problems are there. Because, you know, they're not really, you know, fighting against it. They're well, the like, right is oh. liberalism. The American right is mostly liberal. Like, even yeah, in, like in, old, the, in, like the, old in the old liberals. In the, yeah, in the traditional like the past. Word. Well, yeah. Well, like, I'd say even like with neoconservatism, it's. Like both sides are like we're stuck with a liberal system. Both options we choose: it's either you get the liberals that might do Keynesianism, or you get the liberals that are going to try to do Reaganomics again. Yeah, and both of those are actually, bad. Actually, options. that's Reaganomics is libertarian to a certain extent, which is a form of liberalism. <laughs> yeah, what neoliberalism? Like no, I agree. Most of our political sphere is, is dominated by liberalism. Most of our culture is dominated by liberalism. It has penetrated all parts of society. That ideology is pervasive everywhere. Even like the most staunch neo-Nazi is still going to have some liberal ideations because of how much it permeates into the brain. Yeah, yeah. Or the most staunch communist. Actually, you see that all the time from both of them where they'll have weirdly liberal opinions at times. Actually, like, not like, yeah. On, on, yeah, like, on, on, on what kind of things exactly do you mean? Like, um... okay, you can see it. It can vary. Like for Nazis, you can see like sometimes like a weird pro LGBT streak out of them, or you don't expect uh, that. Yeah, I mean that's what I was kind of thinking. Like you mean like social issues wise? Because yeah, I can certainly see that. And also with um, economics, yeah. like George Lincoln Rockwell <laughs> was just he just wanted a libertarian authoritarian republic. Like it's weird yeah. to say libertarian and authoritarian, but he wanted libertarian economics, authoritarian. Uh, uh, structure of things. Yeah, sorry, I just got a random phone call from like Houston, Texas. I have no idea what that was. Junk mail, junk Texas. call, or sorry, spam call. I meant to say. Yeah, probably a spam call. It smells like a spam call. Anyway. Or it's oh, it might be. USA. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, about I it. get spam calls from India. Yeah, I call them like, who's calling from India? And then they like hang up for like no reason. So they already found you out. That's fine. But back to the topic. Actually, no. I think I think we've gotten through a whole lot today, and I think it was it was really good. I, I will be honest. Yeah. I, I was I was zoned I was zoned out for a good bit of that because I was reading through some old. Um, text channels from a different server i was on watching reading where they were basically insulting me um a oh, ted suit um communists are not really liberals because they want to destroy liberalism and nazis also aren't socialists either like they, they but that's wrong on like two different fronts like Communists want to destroy liberalism because liberalism failed on its problem um, promises nazis want to destroy 
socialism, liberalism, and all of it because it um, basically is a reactionary modernist movement that wants to recreate a mythic past, specifically like the Volkish past. Well, okay, well, yeah, Nazism, yeah. Yeah, Nazism, I would say so, yes, but fascism itself is... Not, is um... Oh, like, like it, not, it, fascism. It, well, well, no, well, Nazism and fascism are different, though. I'm not saying yeah. they're, they're different, obviously. But yeah, and like, um, the idea of fascism. Fascism is more is. It's not the same. It's it's of course they're not a lot um exceedingly similar. But fascism and socialism are similar in the fact they are both modernist ideologies. I'd say they're kindred spirits. I'd say like, I'd yeah, say Mussolini is spirit. closer to like the Soviet Union than he is to Hitler. I mean, he was a socialist, so he was a socialist. He, he in... took a lot of his, uh, well, he, he took some of his inspirations from Marxianism. I, I, I'd say less Marxian. I'd say a lot more on the syndicalist with Sorel. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Duh, duh, yeah, really George really Sorel. Really yeah, I really forgot. Yeah, like uh, that's where he got yeah. the whole idea with like, and also the whole fascist movement as a whole took a fair bit. Like, yeah. the, um, I, the Regency of Canaro slash Fiume like had socialist fa- proto fascists. A whole swath of people just in exchanging ideas because yeah, they just kind like, of tolerated each other because they thought they were there. Yeah, a lot of the Italian fascists uh, were kind of like national syndicalists. I, I wouldn't say not national syndicalists. I'd just say national. Like they were definitely corporatists. They didn't want the unions in charge. They wanted class collaborationism where the state and labor and the private businesses were all forced to work together. Yeah, like. I think if I was reading it correctly, they weren't like syndicates or like. Um, they, well, they had the written. system where where it was the council of corporations, right? Where certain bodies, let's just say, I was a member of the intelligentsia, I would elect someone to go to the council of corporations, and let's just say I had issues with the owner of the university. The state would mediate between the guy who I elected, who I brought up my grievance to, and the owner of the university, and they would work out a deal. To an yeah. extent, like uh, FDR's NRA, it was also an attempt at an American corporatism, and also Singapore is corporatist, I believe. China also shows some signs of corporatism because it seems to be the best system if you don't want a purely liberal capitalist system, lean on corporatism. That's the answer. Yeah. All right. I think I think that's good. I think we've hit all the time that we need to. Um, join yeah. with me as we, well, you know, this is, um, not the usual prayer we have, but this is one I, I want to try and get us to say more. We haven't officially adopted this, but this is a prayer written by Her Majesty Queen Liliokulani, the last monarch of Hawaii. <clears throat> join with me, please. O oh Lord, thy loving mercy is as high as the heavens. It tells us of thy truth that is filled with holiness. Amen. I don't know if we're going to keep that prayer. I just like it because I think it's simple. It was written by a monarch who, in her writing that song, it was actually her asking God to forgive those who had overthrown her. And so I think it's kind of a good one for us to use. But thank you for joining us tonight, or whatever time it is where you're watching this, and I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you. Okay, hold on one second while I end the...